war, it was do I support America who are going to anyway go into Iraq. He thought with that mindset he had no choice but to do it. He sought characteristically a third way by getting Bush to the UN. But he thought his unswerving alliance with the President of the United States was a precondition for Labour's continued <coughs> electoral success, and it destroyed him. And these two figures, who did all this in order to be popular, are now almost exiles in their own country. Blair being told, don't go near the launch of the In Europe campaign, you're too loathed and unpopular, Brown nowhere near it either. And they did, the, their downfalls were, were kind of brought about by their attempt to be electable and popular. And I think in that tragic context, two things happened. One, the Labour Party became confused about what it was for. Here it was being accused of being reckless with the City of London, of forming a too close alliance with a Republican president in a calamitous war. What, what, what has happened to this party? The second thing, and this is crucial, Blair and Brown were the two most dominant figures in British politics for a very long time. And they didn't really allow anyone else to grow underneath them. It's one of the differences with Cameron. Cameron copies Blair in many ways. But Cameron allows perhaps too much his cabinet ministers to breathe. Look at how he allowed Andrew Lansley to develop a health policy which Cameron claimed he didn't know was being developed. I have doubts about that. But Ian Duncan Smith on welfare, Osborne dominance at the Treasury, um, and so on. Blair and Brown were utterly dominant. And so when they went in that traumatic context, half-formed politicians surfaced on the political stage. Unused to scrutiny, unused to public advocacy, unused actually to a lot of politics, because they had been shoved. And as a result, we had a 2010 leadership contest in the Labour Party, which was pretty dull. Then we had a complicated <coughs> period where Ed Miliband <coughs> said New Labour was, was moving on from New Labour, but he actually was wholly controlled. He inherited the desire to control every message, to decide every policy. Ed got very neurotic if a cabinet minister issued half a sentence which diverted from him. He didn't like debate. Uh, he was frightened by debate as much as Blair or Brown or Peter Madison or any of those others. So, for example, the pre-election Labour Party conference last year, before the election, when polls suggested Labour were going to, in some form or another, win, was one of the dullest events I've ever attended in a competitive field of dull events. <laughs> People were scared to say anything. I remember going towards a fringe meeting which had quite an exciting title, uh, in which one of the speakers was Rachel Reeves, one of the rising stars in certain comments. And I said to Rachel as we were walking towards it, what are you going to talk about? And she said, I'm not going to go any further than the cost of living crisis. And that was really all they were allowed to say, that if you continue with the Tories, there will be a cost of living crisis. Incidentally, a revealing flaw, because no one human talks about a cost of living crisis. People who are poor don't sound suffering from a cost of living crisis. <laughs> but that was the degree of animation at a pre-election conference. In contrast, the Tories' pre-election conference, when they were in a state of paranoia about UKIP, fizz with ideas and excitement, dangerous as well for a leader, but they became more interesting. Labour was boring itself to death. <laughs> and that is almost as dangerous as what has happened now, this extraordinary, fragile situation where you have a parliamentary party opposed to a leader backed by its members. Boring yourself to death is also dangerous. And what happened then, and I've made notes for you on this, um, is the leadership contest that followed Labour's traumatic defeat. Now, this is why I argue counterintuitively that the Corbyn phenomenon is not necessarily all that for Labour. Because if you go to the leadership contest pre-Corbyn, 
you enter a festival of vacuous waffle. <laughs> Remember, Labour have lost twice now. People are free to speak. There was no leader. There was about to be a contest. Ed Miliband resigned the day after. And this was the quality of analysis. I've made some notes from you in direct quotes. David Miliband, the brother of Ed, was interviewed two or three days after Labour's election defeat in New York, looking surprisingly cheerful. <laughs> um, now remember, he aches to lead the Labour Party, he aches to be seen as the philosopher king who can guide his party back to the promised land. This was his post-mortem and navigation to the next election. David, we need to own the future. We turn the page back when we should have turned the page forward. Thank you very much. That's very, very clear. There's a navigation through the complex, turbulent waters that we are all living in. Let's return. I mean, in fairness to him, he's in the United States. He had to be careful because he knew his brother was watching, etc. John Crutz, the current philosopher king of the Labour Party, the head of ideas and policy in theory anyway, not in practice, under Ed Miliband. John Crubbis, his post-mortem after the election. We must now go to some very dark places to find out what's wrong. Well, thank you very much, John Crubbis, for that guide to the future. Does he need Sweden in the winter? It's not at all clear. One of my favourites is... Um, Liz Kendall was quite, I mean, she was quite lively during the conference, certainly the early part, pre Cook Corbyn, but this was her defining pitch for the leadership in an interview with The Guardian. I went to school in Watford. Well, you know, I went to school in North, you know, North London. And this was not the, we all kind of know what they're trying to say by these things. I'm not dismissing them entirely. But this was low-level, insubstantial stuff. And even Blair, who, when he wants to, can communicate at a genius level, frankly, um, he attended a progress rally. And um, it was a, not a rally, it was sort of in a room like this. And it was a post-mortem uh, of the election. And he walked on, and he, he still got the knack of appearing like he did in the mid 90s. You know, so, great to see all that. You know, that sort of self deprecating very, very dead. Now, remember, he is a communicator, whatever else you think about him. And this was his prescription We must own the future, but we must make the future our comfort zone and not a pass. Well, thank you very much. Now, Unsurprisingly, in that vacuum, but only in retrospect, none of us expected it at the time. That was the dream canvas on which Jeremy Corbyn arose. Here was someone with certainty, albeit certainties formed in the late 70s and early 80s and untested and unchanged since then. He's not been challenged because he wouldn't have entered arenas where he would need to be challenged. Um, but compared to that festival of Wattle, here was someone who attended rallies like a rock star saying, Trident, I believe we should get rid of it. Uh, quantitative easing, they used it for the banks, we'll use it to renew jobs in Britain and all the rest of it. Suddenly, there was a kind of hope after the festival of Wattle. And I think it is in that context that he rose. Of course, it's part of a wider phenomenon, Scotland, Spain, Greece. There's something bigger going on. But if Labour had produced substantial figures with governing experience, with ideas, tested in internal debate, bigger figures would have surfaced in that leadership contest. And there weren't any. And the one that some people thought were going to win, Chukramana, he didn't even last more than three days. Um, and so it's not retrospectively as surprising as it appears that Corbyn took them by storm. 
And in a way, this is why I think the catharsis is good. In reaction to Corbyn, someone, somewhere, has no choice but to become big. The, they had no chance to become big under Blair and Brown. Blair and Brown did it. Someone now has to start to define themselves, has to build up a set of ideas, and actually make sense of why they are not with Cameron and Osborne, but are also not with Corbyn. You saw that starting to happen at the end of the leadership contest, where Yvette Cooper, who pre-Corbyn, gave this classic quote, we must learn from the election, where is it? Oh yes, we must learn from the election that Labour's task is to make life better for families. Well, you know, I mean, who's against that? <laughs> but, my other favourite, I'll tell you this other one, the other great uh, figure, Tristram Hunt. By the way, I don't think not any of these figures. I'm pro-politics, and I admire them for being in there, and, you know, it's much easier for journalists to comment. But the point I'm making is they haven't dared to think, let alone anything else. Tristram Hunt, the historian, uh, he briefed the colonists that he was about to make a major contribution with an Observer article. And the conclusion was, we appeared irrelevant, we must become relevant. Well, <laughs> I know no one who stood for irrelevance in any context. <laughs> so, in came Corbyn with these certainties. And now we have the consequence, which everybody knew would happen, but hadn't fully thought through. And one of the fascinating consequences is this. It raises that other great Shakespearean theme of loyalty in politics. To whom are you loyal to? Ideas, the people, your 